بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف وجعلنا من أعوانه وأنصاره in the name of Allah the compassionate the merciful this is our tenth session which is based on lesson seven, position of philosophy. And today, inshallah, we are going to talk about the essence of the problems of philosophy and also about principles of philosophy and aims of philosophy. As you remember, we said that moral uh, sorry, uh, philosophical problems are all related to being qua being. In other words, philosophical problems are related to general states or qualities of being. If we want to have a full understanding, a better grasp of philosophical problems, we need to wait till we discuss each philosophical problem one by one and then later we will have a very good understanding of the nature of philosophical problems. But it may be uh, not uh, that much pleasant for a beginner for a student of philosophy to wait till he finishes a whole series of, series of philosophical lectures to see the, what is the nature of philosophical problem. So to have a taste of philosophy, the author tries to introduce to us uh, some of the philosophical problems which are very important, which are very profound, very deep and this hopefully will let us know why philosophy is so important and what sort of judgments we are going to make in philosophy, what sort of uh, debates we are going to have in philosophy. Okay. For example, just as I said, these are just some examples and inshallah we will have much more examples and much more detailed discussions about the same examples. For example, one of the very important questions that comes to human mind and it is not exclusive to any age or any uh, race any group of people. No, it's a universal question. And that is whether we will survive death or not. Whether we will be totally destroyed by death or not. After we die, our bodies will, in most of the cases, will be destroyed. But does it mean that we also will be destroyed, we will lose our identity, we will lose our reality, we will lose our being and existence totally, or we will uh, still be there but with different uh, state, not with this body. So this is a very important question and we cannot expect physics or chemistry or mathematics to undertake the responsibility of offering answers for this question because they cannot experience the life after death or mathematics cannot do anything here. This is a philosophical problem and it is only philosophy that can give us answer. It is philosophy that can tell us that whether our reality is totally material or it is spiritual. And whether spirit 
admits time and space or not whether the spirit disappears is immortal or is mortal all are philosophical problems the other question which is also very important is human being free or determined the issue of free will is very important issue and this is also one of the historical questions and the only way to answer to this question is through philosophy it is philosophy that tells us to understand the real meaning of free will and determinism and to examine ourselves to realize whether we are free or not and to see whether causality is in opposition in, in conflict with uh, free will or not the other important example is the possibility of knowing something this is a very important idea are we able to know something or not and how can we know something these are fundamental questions in epistemology theory of knowledge and this is also again a philosophical issue or for example in morality in ethics and some also other disciplines we are in need of defining values what is good what is bad what is right what is wrong what is the reason that something becomes good or bad so these are the questions which are very important are moral values absolute or they are relative are they constant or they are changing these are very important questions and the only way to respond them is to philosophize or if you want to know whether there is a creator for this world and whether that creator is limited or unlimited is changing or non-changed or for example whether the creator is abstract or is material is time binding or time bound or not bound all these questions need to be discussed philosophically of course if you prove the existence of god and the truth of religion by your reason by your intellect then later you may use uh, religious scriptures but first of all you cannot uh, start with religious uh, scriptures unless you have already established the truth of religion philosophically the other question which is also very important is the extent of experimental knowledge to what extent we can know we can understand through experiments are our experiments valid are they helpful or they are just perhaps um, misleading us they are just confusing us there is nothing outside these are philosophical questions which are very important in any case there are many many important issues for human beings which really occupy our minds and you cannot find any peace and rest and confidence until you have question these questions answered these questions replied and this is through philosophy so the author says that considering these examples and these reflections we can conclude that there must be a knowledge a science a discipline which is very general which is very expanded very extensive very broad 
that studies all forms of being, all sorts of existence in absolute way, not limited beings, and then helps us to understand the answers for all these questions and similar questions. And that is first philosophy, al-falsafatul ula, or metaphysics. Even philosophical disciplines such as moral philosophy, such as political philosophy, such as philosophy of law, such as theology, all depend on first philosophy or metaphysics. And it is metaphysics that help us, first of all, to understand general states of being. And then we can enter into uh, secondary disciplines. For example, in metaphysics we understand that how beings are related to each other and that there is a relation of causality between the beings. We understand that everything which can be experienced, which can be observed or uh, understood through our experiments is time bound and is limited, is changing, is mortal. At the same time we understand that there must be something which is not changing, unchangeable, which is not m moving, unmoved, and that is the one that stabilizes the world and gives motion and changes to other things. We understand that beings are divided into necessary and contingent, into abstract and concrete, into changing and unchanging. We understand the answer for our curiosity through this science, and that is metaphysics or first philosophy. So philosophy is very important, metaphysics is very important, and you could understand a little bit the nature or the essence of philosophical problems. The second part of this lesson is regarding principles of philosophy. And we mean by principles of philosophy, mabadeh. al mabade, and when you add it, becomes mabade ul falsafa. If you remember, we said that we are two sorts of mabade. Let's look at the screen. So, principles of philosophy, okay, that is about the old falsafa. We said that there are two forms of principles or mabade, conceptual which is al mabade at tasawwuriya so conceptual principles and assertive or propositional principles al mabade at tasdiqiya okay regarding conceptual principle or principles we will see how many are there? Of philosophy, the author says that the subject matter of philosophy is being. Okay? Being co being. And this is self evident. Inshallah, we will discuss this later. This is a concept which is obvious, self-evident, which is badihi. 
okay? So you don't need any other discipline to help you to understand the subject matter of philosophy. So the subject matter of philosophy is self-evident and obvious and we don't need to discuss it that much. Then you have the subject matters for the philosophical problems. So this is the main subject matter, okay? If you remember, then we, we said that for problems of each discipline, you have some either parts of the main subject matter or particulars of the subject matter, depending whether the subject matter is a whole or a universal. Here is a universal. So when you have, uh, for example, philosophical problems based on contingent being or necessary being you will uh, study what is the meaning of contingent or what is the meaning of necessary when you want to discuss that problem so the main subject matter is self-evident we don't need to discuss it before or we don't need to discuss it in other disciplines Derivative subject matters, or you could say subjects of the philosophical problems, can be discussed whenever it's needed, whenever you want to discuss that problem. Now let's see what is the situation with assertive principles. If you remember, we said other disciplines all need in uh, their principles, especially in assertive principles, they need or metaphysics. Now let's see what is the case regarding philosophy itself. Assertive principles are first of all related to whether the subject matter of the science you are discussing exists or not? This is a very important question. If you remember I said for example medicine studies human body, illness and health of human body. But whether human body exists or not it's not a medical question. Okay? So, here, for philosophy, when we want to see whether the subject matter of philosophy, whether being exists or not, whether being is reality or not, again, the author says that this is obvious, this is self-evident. We may need to prove the existence of human body or matter or, for example, spirit, soul and so on but to prove that there is a reality that ex there is a form of existence at least there is something that exists is not in need of any argument this is obvious and if someone makes doubt about this he just needs to be uh, given some help some assistance to get rid of this problem and to help him understand that this is not an illusion. But you cannot argue with someone who denies everything and makes doubt in everything. Inshallah we will discuss this later. So whether the subject matter of philosophy exists when you are talking about philosophy is obvious. The second part of assertive principles is concerned with 
some principles that help to argue in that science. For example, before I go to philosophy, for example, in physics, you do lots of experiments. But whether experiments can prove something or not, whether the scientist who observes or makes experience in his lab is getting close to reality or not, whether, for example, induction is valid or not, what are the conditions for a valid induction, all are things that you need to know before you enter physics. And these are principles, these are al for physics. Of course, these are assertive principles. So now let's go to philosophy. Has philosophy any need for any principle that helps a philosopher to argue or not? Okay, now look at the screen again. The author says the principles here Okay. The author says principles here are again divided into two. Some principles for philosophy are self-evident. Self-evident principles. And we don't deny that. Like what? Like, for example, the principle of contradiction. Principle of contradiction. The principle of contradiction. Okay? We say that when you have A, it's not possible to have not A. So A and not A never can be together. Either you have A or non-A. You cannot have both and you cannot have none of them. You must have one of them. So neither in existence nor in nothingness they can be together. Okay? So this is a principle that is called Ummul Qadaya, mother of all propositions. And of course you need this in philosophy, but this is obvious, self-evident. You don't need to prove it in other discipline. So there is no need here for philosophy to borrow from other disciplines. Is there anything which is not self-evident, anything which is stipulative and you need to sort out before you enter philosophy? The author says nothing from experimental sciences or from mathematics. There are only two things that we need to know. We need some basic elements, basic principles of epistemology. So something from epistemology and something from logic. And these are two things that we need to learn. But as we will discuss later in lesson 11, we will see that what we know here from epistemology or logic is not something that we must to acquire from outside. These are the rules of our mind. And we just need to be 
reminded. So these are not things that we need to borrow from other disciplines. Anyway, if there is any need for metaphysics, it is only need to epistemology and logic, because these two help us to understand uh, whether we can know something and how we can know something, how can we can argue, how we can get rid of fallacies, and so on. Okay, so this is a very important part of l lesson seven. The last part of lesson seven regards aim of philosophy. Every discipline has a direct aim and also some indirect aims, immediate aim and some aims which are not immediate. The immediate aim of every discipline is to know something. Human beings are interested in knowing. Even if you don't get any practical benefit from your knowledge, still you prefer to know. This is one of the original desires and genuine desires of human being. There's a thirst for knowledge. But apart from that, there are some indirect or secondary aims. For example, we want to know medicine because we want to um, cure, cure ill people, we want to improve conditions of life, and so on. Or we want to, for example, uh, get close to God by serving the people of God, and so on. What is the aim of philosophy? Naturally, the first aim is to know general states of being and very profound questions that we address in philosophy. But apart from that, philosophy is very important because philosophy helps us to understand our relation to God the Almighty and the world around us. And it makes our life purposeful. It gives meaning to our life. Indeed, human life is human only when a person finds answers for those fundamental questions. If we just eat and drink and sleep, this is not a human life. So we need to go beyond. So philosophy is very important in helping us to find answers for our human questions. It is also important and one of the aims of a person who studies philosophy can be to serve other disciplines. As you saw before, there are many things, many principles of other disciplines that must be studied in philosophy. But philosophy is not in need of those disciplines. And the other thing is that someone who studies philosophy is equipped with a very good instrument to refute attacks made by those who do not believe in religion or those who not, do not believe in God. And they try to show that, for example, they have intellectual arguments against religion. They want to show that philosophy is against revelation. But a person who is equipped, well equipped with philosophy can refute all these claims, all these allegations, and prove and defend religious beliefs and claims as we see in the works of Muslim philosophers, great Muslim philosophers, whose philosophy was not against their religion, was not against their faith, rather was in service to their religion and was serving their religion and in entire compliance with their faith. Also, philosophy is important in uh, spreading Islamic and human uh, values because philosophy is a universal language that all rational people understand. And if you can support your ideas, the values that you hold philosophically, then other people also will understand and will realize, will appreciate. So in this 
lesson, we uh, studied the nature or essence of philosophical problems and also principles of philosophy and finally aim of philosophy or aims of philosophy if there are more. وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا أَنَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرض In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful This is our 11th session and inshallah we are going to discuss the eighth lesson of the book, Philosophical Instructions. The title of this lesson is The Method of Philosophical Inquiry. So we want to get familiar with the method of philosophical inquiry in contrast to the experimental method. The author begins with a deep um, regret about uh, the approach that some people have taken towards philosophy. Some people who are influenced by the positivist way of thinking have said that there is no value in philosophical inquiry because the only method which can bring certainty and which can be valid is the experimental method which is used in natural sciences or in more uh, expanded way in experimental sciences because as you know experimental sciences are divided into natural sciences and human sciences. Of course Positivists are very much interested in natural sciences and also then in human sciences because they think that modern human sciences are all based on experimental knowledge. So people who are influenced by this way of thinking, they say that we have no appreciation of philosophical inquiry because philosophy belongs to the time in which modern sciences were not developed, experimental knowledge was not flourished, and philosophy is the infancy of sciences. And now that we have the fortune of having modern sciences, experimental knowledges, so we don't need any more to inquire in the way that philosophers teach us. And the author says that some people among Muslims who have been influenced by this way of thinking have gone so far to say that indeed the Quranic method of inquiry and the method that the Quran teaches us and recommends us is also the experimental method. And by mentioning some simple examples, like for example the Quranic call for reflecting on the creation of camel or for example mountains and so on and so forth they said that the Quran also is in favor of rejecting philosophical and rational method and just focusing on the experimental method so this has caused the author to allocate one lesson on the importance and significance of the philosophical inquiry and indeed on the intellectual and rational way of inquiring. So, as I said, some people have said that rational method is not bringing any certainty. Philosophy belongs to the time in which the real science, real knowledge was not available. Philosophy is the infancy of the sciences. And they say that the most we can expect from philosophy is to provide us with hypotheses 
for modern sciences because there are some areas that we still cannot have experimental investigation and the philosophy can help us in providing us with some hypotheses. For example, in physics, there are hy some hypotheses about the creation of the world, about, for example, the extent of the physical world. And we can benefit from these philosophical hypotheses until we can develop our experimental science and perhaps in future we will uh, not need philosophy even in this regard. And we will replace hypotheses with theories which are backed up by scientific evidence. For example, one of the people who have been very um, unfair towards philosophy is the German existentialist known as Karl Jaspers. He says that philosophy yields no certain knowledge. So you can attain no certainty from philosophy. And as soon as knowledge is accepted by all as certain with decisive reason, that knowledge cannot be considered philosophical. So whenever you have a certain knowledge, you must make sure that that knowledge is not philosophical. But rather, it at once becomes transformed into scientific knowledge. So he says, whenever you have a certain knowledge, this knowledge is a scientific knowledge. Philosophy by no means can produce any certainty. Okay, this is to give you some idea about the way that some people who are influenced by the positivist attitude towards human knowledge have adopted towards philosophy. To see whether this is acceptable or not, the author starts with an investigation about different methods of inquiry. As you know, whoever has studied logic knows that there are three ways in which we can make inquiry and we can make inference. I'm not saying that these three methods are the methods that all are fruitful and bring valid and sound conclusions. But I'm saying that there can be no method of inquiry other than these three. Then we will see, inshallah, whether these are sound or not, or which one is sound and which one is not sound. But all together we have three methods. Because either we have the particular and we want to inference from one particular to another particular. For example, you know that this person is intelligent. And there is another person similar to this person, for example, in age or in race or in uh, appearance. So you say that person A is intelligent and therefore person B also must be intelligent. So you are uh, transmitting the ruling, the judgment which is known for a particular to another particular. This is what is called induction. And our Muslim logicians and philosophers call it estaqra. So if you look at the screen, please. So we have different methods of inference. Okay. One method is induction. Please try also to remember the term which is known to Muslim philosophers and logicians because in future whenever you study 
a textbook in Arabic, you will need that. Al Estegra. And the transliteration is like this Al Estegra. Okay? So this means that uh, you want to go from uh, particulars to universal. Inshallah, I will come back to that later. Then you have analogy at Tamthil. Uh, 